Good to see y'all. Maybe we do the traditional thing. Good morning. There you go. More comfortable with that since you're traditionalists. Take, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to Romans chapter four, 15. Romans chapter 15. One other announcement, we are planning a baptismal next Sunday morning. We already have candidates that are going to be uh, baptized, and if you have not been baptized since you've been born again, uh, I take advantage of this as we said last Sunday. This is an opportunity for you to make your profession of faith. We are to confess our, our faith before men and uh, women and in the church, so it's an opportunity to confess our faith. Uh, baptism is not salvation. If you are saved and born again and you happen to die, you will go to heaven. You don't have to, you will uh, make it. But it's a public confession. It's like staking your flag in the ground and saying, here I stand. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And so uh, Jesus went to the cross. He died on that cross. He was stripped of all of his clothing. The Son of God, God of very God, publicly displayed in shame. Shouldn't we publicly be willing to stand up and say, I'm with him? And baptism is a way to do that. I'm with them. And so humble yourself and be willing to do it. I, I've been baptized twice. I was baptized in high school as a senior, and it was kind of a, I had to do it. My mom and dad made me do it. I really didn't want to do it. But they made me do it, and then I got into the Bible college, went to, into the ministry, and got rebaptized while I was in the ministry first year. So uh, it was the first time that pastor said he ever baptized a preacher. So I, at least it was one somebody's first in the ministry. I want to finish up uh, verse 6. We've been talking about the differences in a church. In chapters 14 and 15 in the book of Romans, as we have been going through verse chapter 14, and now we're finishing this uh, subject up. We won't finish it up this morning, but we will continue it. He's been talking about the differences, and he starts out about the food. Jews wouldn't eat pork. Gentiles could eat everything. So when you put Jews and Gentiles in one church, you had pork eaters and non-pork eaters. And then he talks about the day. You have the, the Jews kept the Sabbath day, the Gentiles did not. And so you had, now you have pork eaters, non-pork eaters, Sabbath day keepers, non-Sabbath day keepers. Remembering that Sabbath day is on Saturday, it's not on Sunday, and God has never changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And so we have these differences, but there are other differences that come in as well. People who are saved from a legalistic background come in and they have all, if they come from a religious background, they have all these little church religious things they bring into the body of Christ when they're born again. And others who have no background in church come in and they bring in, they, ha they seemingly, quite frankly, have more liberty because they haven't had all the hang-ups of the religion they had before they were born again. And we're talking here in a church that is a church that believes that the members are born again and they have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That is, that is a requirement to be a member in this church is that you're born again. And uh, so, so we believe that, and, but we have a lot of different opinion here. Some of you drive Chevy, some drive Ford, some of you non-American cars. And some of you drive and have all kinds of different things. You have a different way of farming. You, some, are, some, don't want, some want to go organic. Some would rather have uh, genetic hybrid corn. And some like this and some like that. And all these differences. And, and God is saying we need unity. The thing that unifies us is not uniformity. Not everybody being the same. But what identifies us is that we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We worship God. 
And in verse 6, we ended up with half that verse last Sunday morning. We said that one accord, you may with one voice glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I wanted to go back over the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a statement of equality and the oneness of the Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has trinity, triune overtones. Look at 2 Corinthians. It'll be on the board for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 3. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, prin- the Trinity, the persons of the Trinity, have different functions in relating to the world. God has, for all eternity, always been the Father. And God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, for all eternity has always taken the place of a son. And the Holy Spirit for all eternity has always been the Holy Spirit, and he has his distinctive job to perform. Each person of the Trinity is fully God in one in essence, and three is the personality. The Father is distinct from the Son, The Son is distinct from the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit is distinct from the Son and the Father. All three have their own personality. All three are one. All three share exactly the same attributes. They're all omniscient, omnipotent. They're all uh, everywhere present, uh, uh, omnipresent. They're all all all-powerful, and they act as one together. The Trinity has an eternal equality, and yet there are distinctions. In fact, this is what theology or theologians call the economy of the Trinity. In other words, they each have their own function to serve. Subordination to one another does not imply inequality. God sent the Son. Look at John 5:24. Verily, verily, the old King James, truly, truly, the ASV, I say to you, who he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but passed out of death unto life. The Father sends the Son. Very distinct. In John 5, 36, we read, this is, but the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. Why? For the works which the Father has given to me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me, and the Father has sent me. You cannot be saved and not believe in Jesus Christ. You can't be saved just because you believe God. You are born again. You are saved you, you cannot be just because you believe God. A lot of people believe in God. You have to personally submit to the gospel which says Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Son of Man, who died on the cross in your place, paying the debt of your sin for all eternity. And he rose again, which is a miracle and a sign that God accepted his sacrifice. And you must accept that sacrifice as well in order to be a child of God. If not, hell is your home. That's all there's to it. You're going to die in your sin. You have to have your sin forgiven as well. And Jesus, the son, Jesus said, the Father and the Son are one. Look at John 10, 29 and 31. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, speaking of those who are born again, he is greater than all, and no one is able to take them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. You know, all that the Father, when you put your faith and trust in God, you're put in Jesus' hands. And then the Father says, it says here, 
My father's greater than all, and no one's able to snatch him out of my father's hand. Put you right there. You are in the hand of Jesus, the Son of God, and you are covered there by the Father as well. If you're truly born again, you cannot lose your salvation. Uh, and he says, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the full, the full name of Christ. I had an uncle, it's Roger's father, my Uncle Aaron. When he got saved, he got saved later in life, and here's what he said. He would always say, the Lord Jesus Christ. He would never say Jesus. He wouldn't say Christ, and he wouldn't say Lord alone. It was always the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said, I say that because that's who he is. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11. Philippians 2, 10 to 11. I'm putting these all on the board. You see, I, I struggle a little bit with this. I want you to find these passages in your Bible, but for sake of time, and I want everybody to see it, and some have a harder time finding it than others, and so I want everybody to read the Scripture, and it's just as powerful reading it off there as it is your Bible. However, I want you to get familiar with your Bible as well, so I'm, I'm betwixt the two. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's the deal. This is not universal salvation here. This is a universal recognition from all who have lived from Adam to this day. Everyone will admit that Jesus is God's Son. whether they believe in him or not. If you're here this morning, you're going to do that. You better do it now. Because if you don't do it now and you die, you will do it at some day. You will stand and you will bow the knee and the neck and you will confess Jesus as Christ is the Lord. I'd advise you to do it now. I'd advise you not to put it off. Furthermore, he says... And this passage, he said, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we have what we call lordship controversy out there. I, I don't see any controversy at all. He is Lord. He is Lord. And he is the one who has made heaven and earth. He is the Lord. He shares the same glory as God. And he is the Lord, the Lord Jesus, and every tongue will confess that. And again, now or later. Now is the advisable time. Later you will say it. Everybody in hell will not deny that Jesus Christ is the Christ or Jesus is Lord. They won't deny that. They're not going to deny that. They're going to admit it. And that will not be the issue in hell from which they will mentally be tortured. They will mentally be tortured because they didn't recognize it down here and refuse stubbornly to do so. They were too proud to admit they were sinners and come to him. His name Jesus, his name Jesus is Savior, humanity. Jo jo Joseph was told by the angel about Mary, she will bear a son, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from his sins. His name in the Hebrew is Joshua. Jehovah saves. So he is already named. Because he's a savior. The name Jesus emphasizes salvation, his savior. Christ is the anointed one, Messiah. And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus is the Savior. Christ is the Messiah who's going to come and rule again on this earth. He's the anointed one. And if you listen to the news lately, and I'm sure most of you do, and probably if you don't, you probably have more peace than the rest of us. But if you listen to the news, our governments of the world are in shambles. We can't get anything straight down here. And let me tell you, in the light of biblical prophecy, it's only going to get worse. It's only going to get worse <clears throat> until the Lord Jesus Christ comes and he cleans up everything in this world and takes every unbeliever out of this world and sets up his kingdom where Jesus Christ will rule and reign over his children. And that government will last a thousand years and there will be peace, and there will be joy and comfort. So now he continues, and he gives us the example of our own redemption. Here's, here's another reason why we need to get along in church. And another reason why if you, if you can work on a Sunday and a guy can't work on Sunday, why you don't have to be bitter about the guy that can't, that works on Sunday, and you don't have to make fun of the guy that can't. It's interesting, isn't it? We, uh, you know, as listening to church conversations over the years, it's really been an interesting thing. Some people, if we don't dress exactly like they dress, they criticize the dress, right? You ever notice that? Ever heard that? Do all of us have to dress alike? Do we all have to come in, the, women come in dressed in black and men in black suits and white shirts and no ties? Well, there's churches like that. Uh, we, we have a lot of differences, right? We have a lot of differences and, and so forth and so on, but somehow we get the idea that everybody has to look like we look. Or we have to dress like everybody else dresses. Uh, the thing that unites us here is that we all are saved by grace and we are all sinners of the worst degrees. Paul continues, he said, Wherefore, accept one another, just as Christ all accepted us to the glory of God. What were the conditions of God, Christ accepting us? We're sinners, every one of us. Every one of us were sinners. You say, well, I wasn't as bad as somebody else. You were all equal. Everybody stands on equal ground when it comes to sinners. If you were to stand on a Sears building in Chicago, over a thousand feet in the air, and look over the edge and look on a street, can you tell if a person's six foot four or five foot six? From that vantage point, everybody looks the same size. And from the standpoint of God's perfect holiness, we all look the same. All have sinned, and all have come short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, no, not one. We all came on those grounds. No difference. If you were saved out of a Christian home, it was a glorious salvation. If you were saved on Skid Row, or you were saved on Death Row, it, you were, it's a glorious salvation just as much as a person saved out of a Christian home. It takes the same act of faith. It takes the same judgment of Christ for our sins to pay for it all. We're all level on that level. And it's all for the glory of God. It's all for the glory of God, just as also Christ accepted us. By the way, the word accept there is in the imperative mood. You, present imperative, you keep on accepting people like they are who are born again. Okay, you don't like cantaloupe. That's okay. You don't like that. That's okay. You don't like to fish. That's okay. You like to fish. That's okay. You like to hunt. That's okay. You don't like to hunt. You like to take care of the animals. That's okay. We're all different. We don't all have to be the same. We don't have to march to the same tune. We don't have to march to the same beat. 
but we march together because we believe in Jesus Christ, and that is the common denominator. And just as Christ also accepted us, same word again. By the way, this word is intense. The word acceptance is there, but it has a preposition affixed to it, and that preposition prefixed to it is the word pros, which means face to face. You accept them face to face, accept them as they are, just as Christ accepted us as sinners. Oh, well, I'm not going to accept you. You're from Oklahoma. That's the way we in Nebraska used to feel when we played them. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> He's a boomer sooner. But the point, of course, is that we're all on the same grounds. Whosoever come to me, what? I will not cast out. You know, the word is used by Philemon in his 17th verse of that book. It says, if you regard me as a partner, here's our word, same word, accept him as you would me. Now look at Onesiphorus. He ran away from Philemon. He was a trusted slave, and he ran away, and he took a lot of money. And now he meets Paul in jail, and he gets saved, and Paul is sending him back to Philemon, and he's saying, you accept him like you would me in my place. And that's how we are to accept one another. The church is to receive those who have placed their faith in Christ and scruples which go along with them. There's to be a compassionate welcome to all the saints as Christ welcomes sinners. We have a, a son and daughter who spent a week ago a week in Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, our son preached there. And he preached at street meetings. They still do that in Nairobi. They still are allowed to preach on the streets and spread the gospel, and people came to know Christ. But you ought to watch them sing. I mean, choo -choo 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 -choo, clear across the stage, and choo -choo 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 -choo, clear across the stage jumping and twirling as they sing Christian songs. Well, if somebody got up and did that here, what would you think? We'd say, don't do that here. And I'm not advising it either, by the way. <laughs> do you think those people are truly born again? This means yes, and this means no here. It's kind of a new thing. The point is, yes. You go to a Brazilian church and they worship altogether different. Honduras, they altogether different. A Jewish church, altogether different, but they have the same gospel message. And they do things that we're just not used to doing, and we do things that they're not used to doing. But that makes them no less a believer. We're to accept one another to the glory of God as he did us. Look at John 6, 37 and 38, about Christ's acceptance of us. John 6, 37 and 38. First of all, he makes a real didactic statement. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. That's interesting, isn't it? You and I are a gift of God to Jesus Christ. You may not have known it when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, but you're a gift from God the Father to Jesus Christ. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. I won't cast them out. For... I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It is Christ's delight to accept us as sinners. What a great thing. In Matthew 9, 13, we have an interesting verse. 
Matthew 9, 13, that talks about this as well. I've had it said to me, uh, uh, did you see who came to church this morning? A, a, a stranger? And I'd say, no. Well, what's he doing here? He's the biggest sinner in town. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. We're here for the biggest sinner in town. We're here that sinners and prostitutes and druggers and all these people can know the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we exist. And Jesus said, go and learn what this means in Matthew 9, 13. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. I'm not here to bring the righteous who don't think they sin. I'm here to get the sinners who know they sin. I'll tell you, believers, we can get very sanctimonious at times. We can get a word we used to use is holy, Joe. I don't know if that's in vogue or not. Church is not for holy Joes. A church is for people who love the Lord Jesus Christ and not just put on an air of, of uh, holiness, but holiness comes out of who and what we are. For I say, then he goes on to say, when you talk about the acceptance now, look at the next line. For I say in verse 8 that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the Father. Now, he's going to enter into a, a really interesting argument uh, of how he accepts this because he's talking to the Jew and then he's going to talk to the Gentile in verse 9. When Jesus came on the earth, he didn't come to my ancestors or yours. He came primarily to the Jew. If in fact, he became a servant to the circumcision the word servant is deacon. Know this verse, John 1, 11? He came unto his own, and what? And his own did not receive him. Who are his own? The Jews. He didn't come for salvation to the Gentiles per se, though that is included. But he came to his own, the Jewish people. And he makes it very clear. Turn with me to Matthew 10, verses 5 to 7. Matthew 10, 5 to 7. In this passage of Scripture. He's sending out the 12 to announce the kingdom is at hand. And here's what he says to them. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them. Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter the way of the Samaritans. Gentiles, totally lost. Samaritans, part Jew, part Gentile. Only go to the Jew. Rather, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is here. The king is here. Don't go to the Gentiles. Another example and is found in Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. Please turn there. Matthew 21, excuse me, Matthew 15, 21 to 28. Verse 21 says, Jesus sent, went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. This is the only place where we have Jesus leaving the land of Palestine, going outside the borders. Uh, there is a reason for this. The Pharisees were hounding Jesus about him not obeying their little legalistic law. The Herodians are hounding Jesus 
The crowds are hounding Jesus, and he hasn't got any time to do anything. And in fact, they tried to make him king after he fed, fed them in John 6. So he goes to Tyre and Sidon to get a little rest and peace. When he's there, in verse 22, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. <clears throat> My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Here's what's interesting. She's a Canaanite. God told Noah that the Canaanites would serve the other two. They were destroyed. In, in the battle at Carthage in North Africa is the last Canaanite we know of even though they were a cursed people. When the children of Israel went into the land of Canaan, they were to kill Canaanite, man, woman, and child. Oh, boy, that makes a liberal shudder. But listen, that religion was so abased, God didn't want his people anywhere near that religion. Every child that was killed went to heaven. And the adults went to hell. And God told him, get rid of him. However, he had mercy toward the Canaanite. Can you think of another Canaanite that was saved? How about Rachel? Not Rachel. What was her name? Rahab. What kind of woman was she? A harlot. That's another Canaanite that was saved. Now, here you have a Canaanite woman who's a Gentile, who's a part of the accursed race, and she comes to Jesus and she says, notice how she addresses him, Lord, and she addresses him, Son of David. She recognizes his deity, Lord, and she recognizes his messianic descent. He's the Messiah. She has a demon-possessed daughter, and she keeps on coming to Jesus. And he, in verse 23, he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. Jesus paid no attention. He simply ignored her. And the disciples strongly request, send her away. She has become a pest. A nuisance. Verse 24. But he, Jesus, answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I don't have anything to do with her. That's not my mission. That sound cruel to you? No, no covenant was ever made with Gentiles, per se. We don't have the oracles of God written to us. We're, we're with the Canaanite woman. I only came from the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. This Canaanite Gentile does not quit. And he answered and he said, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Is that a kind word? There's two kinds of dogs in the Bible, the mangy curs who roam the streets and ate the garbage that people threw out. And there's another word for dog. It's a pet, and the pet dog is used here. This is not good for me to take what belongs to Israel and give to a Gentile. I didn't come for that. And the Jews thought of Gentiles as dogs. But she said, yes, Lord, even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. We have two dogs. And whenever we invite you over to eat, we lock up the dogs. But the minute we, you're gone and we let open the gate, those dogs race for where? The table. And depending on you, You know the rest of the story. So we try to 
feed crumbly stuff so it, we don't have to buy dog food. <laughs> but, the kind, but the thing is, of course, yes, that's true, Lord, but we can eat the crumbs. And Jesus said, verse 28, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed. Jesus commends her for understanding God's plan and heals the daughter at the same time. Wow. You know what we, you know the crumbs are today? The Jews were promised a nation in which Jesus Christ would rule and reign. You know what we get? We get an eternal salvation and we are made the bride of Christ. That's the crumbs. We will rule and reign with Christ forever. <clears throat> That's the acceptance that you and I now have. Jesus' mission was to confirm the promises given to the Gentiles. And he said in Matthew 5, 17, he said, Do not think I came to abolish the law or prophets. I didn't come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth are passed away, not one smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Everything God promised the Jew, they will get. But we get, because of their rejection, we get the so-called crumbs, which are actually the bride of Christ. A greater acceptance. Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who bless curse you, I will curse. Now listen to this, and in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. Our salvation comes from the Jew, and it comes in a funny way. It's their rejection is our blessing in one way. In Je Exodus 3, 5, he says, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he also said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, and that's Jesus Christ speaking here. He's the I am. He's the great I am. In Matthew 7, 19, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and an unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to your forefathers from days of old. That's what he came to do, confirm. But because they rejected that, Jesus and God turned their attention to all of us, and we are saved. Not as an afterthought, obviously, but we're saved because of his grace. And we'll talk about it next week, but Romans says, verse 11, chapter 11, if their fall meant our rise, how much more will their reconciliation be to the rest of us? We have this privileged position to walk into his presence, the bride of Christ. This morning as we take our communion, we have a twofold, really, when we take our communion, is our twofold testimony. It's a testimony to all that we are walking with the Lord, right? You aren't saved by taking communion. The bread remains the bread, and the cup, rem the juice juice in the cup, remains the juice. But it's given to us as a physical reminder to what Jesus Christ did for us. Jesus Christ died on the cross in our place. He gave his body for us. He became a man that he might be able to die as a man, to give his life as a man, to pay the sin as a man. Remember that when we eat the bread. He became flesh for us so that he could die as a man and pay the penalty of our sins as a man. 
but he is hypostatically related to the fact that he is God as well. He is God in one person. And God cannot die, but as a man, he could die for us. And so when he died on the cross, he shed his blood. It was a real sacrifice. He, he, he was judged for our sins in our place, and blood had to be shed. Sacrifice had to be made, and he is it. He is our substitute. He is our sacrificial substitute in our place. And when we take the bread, we are saying and mentally thinking and emotionally getting involved, Jesus Christ, the man, the Son of God, the Son of Man died for me. Unless Christ comes, I'll have to face death someday, as all of us will. <clears throat> I'm not anticipating that particularly. But you know the one thing that encourages me? Jesus went first. My Savior died. He actually died. He went through the process of dying. And I find comfort in that, that he died for me. He went through it, and he was victorious. He didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose again. And I, too, will rise, because I'm one with him. What a great sacrifice he's made here. Let's remember his death, and let's remember his sacrifice as we take the cup. Now, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, we're an honest church. Just don't fake it. We don't want you to take communion just because everybody else is. We want you to be honest with God. He knows it anyway. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, just pass it by. But let me challenge you this way. Here's a great opportunity for you to say, you know, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've turned my back on God. I know there's a battle waging in my heart right now. I want peace. And I know Jesus Christ died for me and paid for me, and he'll forgive me of all my sin. I repent of my sin, and I place my faith in him. Save me, Lord, save me. And he will. He will, right there. It's not some church action that you have to do. It's not some thing, penance, that you have to do. You have to mentally submit yourself in faith to Jesus Christ alone who can save you. And you can do that in a communion service. And we encourage you to do it now. Let us stand as we pray, and we'll ask our men to come and prepare the communion table. Father, we're just <clears throat> overwhelmed with the great salvation we have. We didn't earn it, and we didn't deserve it. We were sinners through and through. By your grace, Father, you took us and separated us out and gave us to your Son. And you, Father, became our Father. Jesus became our Savior. And we became his bride. And all the filthy garments we came into the wedding, you changed. You changed us. And so as we partake of this service, Father, we pray that it would bring honor and glory to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name.